Hello and welcome to our first uh, New York State Network for Bilingual Education program webinar. Uh, this is a, a CUNY NYSED project and today we're going to be presenting on the principles and practices of bilingual programs for secondary schools. Um, this session will be led by Ophelia Garcia, a professor here at the CUNY Graduate Center. We'll be meeting with Mirza Sanchez Medina, uh, who is the founding principal of Manhattan Bridges High School along with Isagma Alonso, Michelle Leonard, and Susan Lally, who are all three teachers um, at the school. Um, Manhattan Bridges High School is really a very special place. It was named within the top 100 schools in the nation according to US News and World Reports and it's actually the top school within that list for schools serving emergent bilinguals. Uh, it's also featured on the New York City Department of Education website for their students with interrupted formal education, their SIF program, for taking these students all the way up to AP level classes. So the agenda today, are starting with introductions, we're going to hear first from Mirza Sanchez Medina, who as I said is the principal of Manhattan Bridges High School. Uh, and then at that point we'll have time for some of your questions to Mirza, uh, followed by presentations from Isagma Alonso, Michelle Leonard, and Susan Lally, um, who are respectively the math teacher, bilingual history teacher, and ESL ELA teacher at the school, followed by questions and answers for the teachers. At the end, Ophelia Garcia will be the discussant, uh, bringing together the threads of the presentation um, and moving our conversation forward. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about Manhattan Bridges High School. We opened our school in 2003 with the mission of working with emerging uh, bilingual students. Presently, we have 520 students, 70% of which are emergent bilingual, meaning ELLs. 30% of them are former Ls or, or students of heritage language. 100% of our students are Latinos, 84% uh, Title I, 4% our students have an IEP, and 9% of our students are emergent bilingual students, uh, overage and under credit students. 27% of our students are SIFE. In addition to that, 75 to 80% of our students come into our school with level one in ELA and level two and three in math. We want to speak a little bit about the work that we do with our students. Let me share a little bit about our school data. In 2014, our graduation rate was 85%. 40 of those students received an advanced regents diploma and one of them with honors. Again, I want to remind you that these are emerging bilingual students that came to our school levels ones and two. According to the school quality guide, the new one, uh, we have 90.7% uh, of our students earn 10 credits or more between grades nine through 11. And compared to our peers, uh, we have 100% weighted regions pass rate in English and math, 96% in uh, science, 97% in US history, 66 in global, and uh, we have a 76% in college readiness. So what we're looking at is how we move students forward um, and embrace their language and ensure that they're college and career ready. And I'll speak a little bit more about career readiness in, in a bit. 88% of our students receive a, a college prep course index. And when we look at the data in uh, the past two years, and we see we see that 90% of graduation of students when the, the rate is captured in six years uh, again. I, I want to talk a little bit about college readiness of this class, 2015, our cohort Q, 120 students. So far, we already have 30 students who complete all the requirements for the Advanced Regents Diploma and two of them with honors. So we'll capture a few more uh, for June graduation. Our college readiness in math is the lowest is 37%, but in EL and English is 68%. In addition to this, because we are a school that has two programs, one for engineering and one for IT, we ensure that students leave our school not just college ready, but also career ready, so they can take um, several industry certifications, for example, IC3, Adobe Photoshop and Autodesk Inventor. Um, I just want to speak about the highlights of our bilingual programs. So we, we have bilingual transitional program and bilingual dual language program and, and, and we'll see the comparison of those. So students leave again like I said before with the experience of taking four years 
of pre-engineering uh, with Project Lead the Way and they take uh, industry certifications. This Project Lead the Way is uh, with the University of Rochester and they get college credit courses. We work in translating many of those courses and I'm amplifying for these students. Students also leave with, uh, they can enter the Academy of Information Technology, take courses at, in college and uh, all students are able to take courses in college in either one of those two programs. So we have accelerated programs, meaning a student can do complete a sequence in math in one semester if we have these students who are talented. We also have honors classes, we have advanced placement courses, and we have college courses for students to be able to take them with the CUNY system. So our program uses both languages and language in our school is a resource so the content is taught in a translanguaging manner where you can see both languages being used and when the teachers speak they'll make reference to that work. We also have uh, integrated levels of ESL and ELA structured classes meaning that ESL and ELA are paired and students have a progression can exit out based on their their ESL level. Continuing with the highlights of this program, you're going to see reading and writing across the curriculum. Teachers will speak about the use of meal as a writing structure across the curriculum, across all grades. The use of argumentative writing combined in, with language and content. A use of graphic organ, organizers, rubrics. We, again, we amplify the curricula and maintain a rigorous program. We have many support structures through our youth development and through our teaching uh, program uh, for SIF, special ed, students with uh, IP, also students who have low literacy in their native language and students who have had inadequate um, instruction. We also have before and after school program, tutoring programs, we have ESL, we have AP courses starting in the 10th grade for students and the regular Saturday uh, Regents programs for other students. We also have Regents program uh, prep during the school day for students who cannot stay after school or come on Saturday and to support them. Our periods are 72 minutes long. I also want to uh, compare a little bit our transitional and our dual language programs because often these get confused. So our they're both bilingual programs. The transitional bilingual program is focused on the newcomer. Um, for the dual language, it's more for the heritage language learner. And we designed it this way because we wanted to capitalize on the culture of the students and on their understanding of the Spanish that is spoken also at home or uh, the family, extended family. Again, the transitional program starts from the beginner to intermediate. We use native language instruction as the base and then we grow from there gradually introducing more and more English. Uh, the goal is that students will end up by the junior year taking most of their classes in English uh, and still taking advanced placement courses in Spanish, Spanish language or Spanish literature and end up with hopefully uh, with a biliteracy uh, seal. Students are also expected to take honors and AP classes um, and we offer those in junior and senior year and sometimes we have pilot classes that we start in the 10th grade when we see the students are able to handle advanced placement courses then. By senior year all students are integrated and they also have industry certification. You're going to see a similar program for the dual language students except that for them they start more mainly in English and gradually we introduce more Spanish courses and the hope is that by junior year and that's the plan that we have for them and we've been doing this since 2009 the plan is for them to end up also taking advanced placement courses and taking us uh, at least half of the program in Spanish by the junior and senior year again they also uh, need to take uh, industry certifications I want to add that we have advanced placement courses in AP uh, uh, Spanish Spanish language, Spanish literature, English language, uh, statistics, calculus, um, uh, um, macroeconomics, and uh, environmental science. And these are th these courses are offered to both students, transitional bilingual and 
um, dual language students because by junior and senior year there isn't much of difference in terms of where the student is and their and their growth in language development. I want to share with you some of the recent recognitions that we've received and Sarah spoke a little bit about it. We are a gold seal school with the US News and Reports as the best high school um, in, in the nation category. So we're number 51 in the nation and number 7 in New York State and New York City. Again, this is based on how we move the students forward uh, from those levels once and two into advanced placement courses, college courses, advanced courses, uh, honors courses, and the support that we give them. And you'll see when the teachers speak about the work that we do, how this work happens. Recently, we were uh, mentioned as and participated as the top 100 most selected schools in the nation based on this work. Um, and it's nice to see that the ELL mission is moving forward. Univision just did a report on us and this work and showed how, how we do this and then again the New York City Department of Education has a video on their SIFE we website where you can see a little bit more about uh, this work with SIFE and students and, and we we mentioned in our group and in our school we don't we don't speak about SIF or, or ELLs our what we see are students and it's our work in uh, developing the program that most is most appropriate for them. So I'm gonna take some questions now. One of the questions is, how did you build the structures necessary for SAIF students to succeed academically? So one of the work that we do that we didn't get to mention is we assess all students from the moment they come into, this, into the school. So we don't just take the label that they come with. We assess the student and we figure out what is going to work best for those students. So at times, that is an additional support in, in native language. At times, that is additional support with English. At times, that is additional support with math uh, from pulling them into a small group or adding uh, at more, um, another semester of work. We ensure that these students, we know who they are and that we provide for them uh, support, especially in the youth development, because most of the time the, these students have difficult lives and we, we need to assure that we are taking care of their needs and then figure out a program that it's going to work for them and not just a program for all, but a program for a particular student. Another question that I have here is, if you have to advise to a principal wanting to open a bilingual program, what would you say? And one, a very important piece about opening a bilingual school, first of all, is understanding, knowing where you want to go, what do you want to do, understanding uh, your expectations. You, uh, for, for example, in our case, we knew we wanted students to be taking advanced placement courses, so we built the school, the structures throughout the whole four years for students to be able to take these courses and be successful in, uh, in these courses. Um, secondly, you, you want to use data, continuously use data to analyze, analyze uh, where, where you're going, to revisit the program, to enhance it, to uh, ensure that what's working well, you want to make sure that, that you foster that program and you foster teachers and, and staff members who are really doing great work and, and support them and at the same time ensure that you're working back at what's best for the students. So at that school, we keep asking ourselves out that question: What is best for, you know, the student that we have at hand, and how do we ensure that this program for that student is the correct one? In addition to this, understanding the background of the student and in, and involving the student as partner in this conversation is extremely important because often the student uh, can tell you what is what works best for him or for her. Another question that we have here is how much curriculum is teacher made versus a package program? Um, I have to say my teachers work three, four times more than others had that could use a package program. Um, they, they have to amplify the program, they scaffold, they develop uh, graphic organizers, they, are, they, are, they will work for, for all students in addition to translating. So for the parents, another question that we have here is, do you do something with parents to, he to help their kids? So we provide English classes, immigration courses, we have an open door policy so students can literally come into the school and meet with principal, parent coordinator, guidance counselors and the like. Um, we help 
help parents uh, help their students by giving them pointers as opposed to, you know, where what to look for and and how to help their child. We have workshops for parents all the time. Another question that I'm receiving is, uh, what is your philosophy of education, and what what does it take? shape vision for the school. So the vision of the school is building bridges for the future. So we work at using everything at hand and we are Freudians, meaning that we partner with students, not just deposit on them information. So what one of the pieces that we always look at, how can we improve what we have at hand? Uh, we don't dwell on our successes and we are very harsh on ourselves. We are very reflective upon the work that we do with a, a tremendous amount of commitment to, to the students and to the work. So we're looking at not just ensuring that we do very well and that the numbers are great, but also that we're building a student to be college ready, career ready, and life ready. That means that we're going to look at that individual student and build that child uh, so that he or she is ready for college and beyond. We have many, many of our students come back and say, you know, this course you taught it was really good, this practice was good, I wish we had more of, of this, more of that. So we've come back to our academic program and built that program program back uh, based on what our students are uh, giving us to ensure that those coming up continue to grow. We also have a iMentor program, so we have students uh, aligned or paired with a professional so who's going to work with them uh, throughout the week and then once a month they meet at our school and parents are invited to come in. So we also use partnerships as, as uh, support for the work uh, that we do. Um, another question that I'm having here, uh, receiving here is which assessment do you use as student enter? So we have a uh, school develop uh, assessment. Uh, in the past, we've, we started to use assessments that were prepared by others, and we realized that we were not being true to our vision and mission. We truly believe that as we are building this program, and again, we opened in 2003, so we've had time to make mistakes and learn from our mistakes and then build that. Thank you very much for, for your questions. I'm now going to have our teachers speak. Uh, again, you're going to uh, hear from Isagma Alonso, a math teacher who's been with us for a number of years. I'm going to hear from Michelle Lenore, uh, extraordinary teacher and the way she gets students to pass the U.S. history regions. And Susan Lally, uh, an amazing, amazing teacher who, who really thinks through this process of helping students reach their, the highest level in academics. So, um, Isagma, thank you very much. So, like Misa said, I'm a math teacher at Manhattan Bridges High School, and today I am going to talk about how we allocate uh, language, math classes uh, based on language. Uh, then I'm going to share some students' perspective with you and some student work. First, I want to talk about the language allocation. When students come to us in ninth and 10th grade, like Mesa says, we have the transitional bilingual who are usually uh, Spanish dominant, and then we have the dual language students who are, who are usually Sp English dominant. So we allocate the Spanish dominant students in a class where the teacher mostly speaks Spanish and uh, teaches in Spanish, and the dual language students in a class where the teacher mostly teaches in English. However, the, the written language of the class class is going to be based on the regions they have to take at the end of the year. So in Algebra 1, because the regions is available in Spanish and English, we have the written language of the class be Spanish for the class taught in Spanish and in English for the class taught in English. However, I am teaching a common core geometry class. I'm teaching one to Spanish dominant students in Spanish, one to English dominant students in English. But the written language is all in English because the test is only available in English. So then I have to work with uh, uh, my Spanish dominant students, specifically with vocabulary. Here you see, for example, the first slide that I use in all my classes. And what I want you to look at is how all the language of the class is introduced in, in this slide. And at this level, at this point, students, the only word here that I actually had to add to my uh, word wall was catch a tier two word that they didn't, they had a master. At the beginning of the year, we have to deal with the fact that many students for the first time encounter all of the written language in English, and we have to move them to recognize cognates, develop vocabulary, and start learning how to understand 
and know which words they have to um, ask for translations. So vocabulary is the key thing that we do. Cognates is one way in which, for example, most tier, uh, tier three words in math are cognates. Perpendicular, perpendicular, parallel, parallela. So they, they, they're easy to recognize. Uh, when I teach my Spanish dominant students, I translate and define level two I mean, tier two and tier three words for my Spanish, uh, English dominant students. I will define tier three words, but I will also translate them to Spanish so they recognize the academic language in Spanish, even though the written language they have in front of them is English. We also talk about um, culture sometimes, like for example, clockwise and counterclockwise, we translate as a favor del reloj y en contra del reloj, but in reality, the correct Spanish academic language would be levo gira and dexto gira. So it's important that they know those words in case they encounter academic language about math from their country. As far as translations, I already told you that at the beginning they want everything translated. We teach them to recognize most of the words, but I do tell them that at any point, especially during the test, because during class they can talk to each other and ask me at any time, but during the test they can ask me to translate anything and I use regions rules. So I translate literally into the whole class. I also provide this glossary, which is a glossary they have available themselves during any regions. So now I would like to share with you some uh, student perspectives. So Nicole Enriquez is a student who is in my English dominant class, but she speaks to me in Spanish exclusively. So I interview her, and the first thing I ask her is, I asked her, is why do you speak Spanish to me during math class? And she said, I feel comfortable. Basically, she said she feels more comfortable speaking Spanish. So then I said, do you do it in other classes? She said, yes, and I said, why? And she answered very specifically. Some of the words I know in Spanish and then not in English. Some words I know in English but not in Spanish. I went on to say, in one language have you usually learned math? And she said, I always take math in Spanish, which is probably why she speaks in Spanish to me all the time. So then I said, have I asked you if you wanted the explanation in Spanish? Sometimes I ask my students if she, they speak Spanish to me. I said, do you want me to explain in Spanish? And she said, yes, I had asked her. And I said, what did you answer? And she said, it doesn't make any difference. She basically went on to say she understands equally in Spanish and English. She just prefers herself to speak Spanish. So my last question is, uh, what are you going to do in college? And she said, I guess English, and smiled. So that was Nicole. Then I interviewed Rosalia Fernandez. Rosalia Fernandez uh, is in my English dominant class, but she speaks mostly, she speaks occasionally, she's in my Spanish dominant class, she speaks occasionally in, in English to me. So I said, in one language have you usually learned math? And she said, in English. Do you prefer explanations in Spanish or in English? And she said, the same, I understand both. Why do you sometimes speak English in my class? She said, some things I know better in English and some I know in Spanish. Are there times where you do not understand something because of the language? She said, never, it's never the language. I understand both. And she said, are you aware that you speak English? And she said, it just comes out in English. So now I just want to show you some student work here. The test questions are in English, the student answer in Spanish, and my comments are in English. Then you have another case where the test questions are in English, student answer in Spanish, and I make comments in Spanish. Then uh, the, the question is in English, the student trans language. They started in English and then they went to Spanish, which is perfectly acceptable. And last you have one where the, the test questions are in English and the student answer in English. So that's my presentation for you today. I want to introduce uh, Michelle Leonor, who is a social studies teacher at our school. Hi, Michelle. Thank you, Alonso. Uh, I am the 11th grade teacher. I teach U.S. history um, and U.S. history honors. My class is primarily, is entirely bilingual, but primarily in English because we do want to make sure that the students' skills are up to par in terms of college readiness. In this first slide that you guys are going to be looking at, there's just an overview of what uh, strategies I'm going to be talking about today that I use in my class, like the classroom environment. Uh, it's just setting the tone at the beginning of the year. Um, as you can see in the picture there, uh, one of the ways that I show my class that I 
love bilingualism and I want them to be bilingual is by having books in English and in Spanish displayed around the room. I also often speak both languages throughout the day and encourage my students to practice whatever their target language is. Um, I say this because my students are all at mixed levels in terms of their English um, language acquisition, but also I have dual language students there and I encourage them to also practice their academic Spanish in my classroom. Visuals are also great for not just for else really, it's just for all learners uh, because they are, like, be they graphic organizers, photographs, charts, whatever they are, they help bridge gaps in understanding, they um, help students grasp, grasp certain topics, they model organization for students, so that's extremely helpful, and they're great memory triggers for students. You show them an image again and then that brings back the whole lesson to them. So it's a great tool not just for our emergent bilinguals. So I'm going to go over some of the strategies that I use in class that involve a lot of graphic organizers and images. Um, so this first um, activity that you're looking at is for the unit on um, Manifest Destiny and Westward Expansion. It culminates in a writing assignment where the students have to write about what, the, what, what progress is. So that's why you see the juxtaposition of Manifest Destiny and Westward Expansion as progress and then compared to the Indian Removal Act. I start this activity with a gallery walk where students have to analyze images and talk about what they think the artist's point of view is and then we move from there into primary documents. The great thing about starting with something like a gallery walk is that it provides a point of entry for all kinds of students, any group of students. They can look at a picture and tell me what they see and tell me what they think the author meant by that and it brings all kinds of literacy in and not necessarily just written word, just some students are better at looking at art. Uh, they move on, so that when they move on to the primary text from this, they have plenty of context to help them decode that primary text in English. Uh, as you can see, the student that's in the top left did his picture analysis entirely in English, and the student in the bottom right wrote entirely in Spanish. The language that they chose to write in in no way affects their ability to engage in this activity, and that's the beauty of it, because at the end of the day, I want to assess their understanding and their thinking, as well as the, their development of their skills. Um, this next activity is very similar. So there is an advantage to doing the same type of activities consistently throughout the year because the students get comfortable with that style, um, with, with like that style of activity. So in this one, the students were looking at the Great Depression. So it's the 1930s, and their culminating writing assignment for this piece was comparing the 1930s, um, the Great Depression, to the recession of the last several uh, last several years. Um, so they looked at some images from the 1930s and. What one thing that I find interesting here is that you see students that maybe at the beginning of the year were writing entirely in Spanish, and you see evidence of them now translanguaging. They're writing in English and in Spanish in the same sentence. When I first encountered this, I did have a moment where I thought, I don't know what to do with this. I want my students to be college ready, and I know that when they get there, they can't necessarily write in both languages in one text. Initially, I was nervous about it, but allowing them to do this allows me to see how their thinking is progressing. That's basically that's all that matters. So one of the biggest things that um, teachers say is difficult for emergent bilinguals is engaging with complex text in English. The reason I say that the language in which they're writing doesn't necessarily impact their thinking is because there are ways to chunk complex text so that they can process it. So one of the ways that I do this in my class is using an activity called a raft. A raft is when you um, it stands for role, audience, format, tone, and topic. So um, for this activity students had to read William Lloyd Garrison's On the Constitution and the Union and also another reading on Calhoun that said it was called Slavery of Positive Good. They're both equally long, equally dense, and I could just see my students faces if I just handed something like that to them like just the dread and anxiety of having to engage with something like that. So a way to make that manageable is to break them up into groups and in a group assign students one portion of the graph. So you're only the only thing that they have to read for is the role. A student has to only read for one other student has to only read for the format or the audience or the tone or the topic. This makes it a lot less scary. So they go through the reading once and Afterwards, they share out, and when they read it the second time, they 
now have all this context for the, for now they know that, okay, so William Lloyd Garrison is a northerner, he's referring to southerners, they have evidence for the text to support what they're trying to, what they're saying. And if you'll notice, the student that um, wrote the, the, the read for topic in that group did it in Spanish. Everybody else in that group did it in English, that student did it in Spanish. That choice in no way hindered that group. That contribution helped the group just as much as any other. Um, for when they moved on to do the second read. Lastly, I wanted to show you a piece of student writing. So this is an excerpt. It's on Jamestown, so it's Colonial America, so it's really the beginning of the year. This is like September for my students. As you can see, the student is writing all in Spanish, and then when she gets to the document, it breaks into English, because the documents were in English, and then breaks back into Spanish. This is a moment where I could in my class just give that back to her and say please write this all in Spanish or entirely in English. Instead I chose to see it as an opportunity. I see here a student that can cite documents appropriately, that can choose excerpt from a text that um, does provide evidence for what she's arguing. I see a student that's attempting not only to explain her evidence but also craft an analysis about the nature of democracy and natural rights. So instead of penalizing a student for using both languages here, I decide to just make that an opportunity to give that student actionable feedback. Now I'll pass this on to, to speak further on this, my colleague Susan Lally who does an excellent job teaching English. English, oh, oh my God, I lost like my ability to speak. <laughs> Anyways, a, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Hi, my name is Susan Lally. I teach ESL and ELA at Manhattan Bridges. This year, I'm currently teaching two honor sections of English. Um, and these are, this class is for the students that we feel really can achieve at a college prep level. Um, and for those students, we sort of raise the bar, as you'll see on my first slide. Um, we discuss a lot of original text. Um, we work with essential questions that um, prompt their critical thinking. These questions um, we come back to all year long. These are just a, a little bit of a sampling. But then they use those in oral discussion and it helps frame their analytical writing. Overall in our English department, I wanted to give a little overview of what we have accomplished so far in our school. One of the big things that we've done is we've really aligned um, on our literacy. We have created a grammar exit criteria for the uh, emergent bilinguals to transition to English classes so that they have the grammar that we know they need to be successful. We have created an honors track with an application so that we can identify those students that we know can pursue English at a higher level. And we now have AP English language class, which obviously also is a very rigorous course. We also have aligned as a school, and this was a really important thing for us, is a long student writing is to unify on what a paragraph looks like so that when they're writing a paragraph in English or in Miss Leonore's class or in their science class, they know that every paragraph has a similar structure. All teachers use the same terminology. We call it a meal paragraph. I'm sure it's, it's uh, something that's, I think, fairly well used now uh, that includes a main idea, the student provides evidence and examples, does an analysis, and then links to the next topic or links back to the main idea. So students now are very familiar with that approach, and that's been a real area of, of success for us and in our English department. Now where we're looking to tighten up a little bit is on our nonfiction. Um, and this is where we're going now and what we're working on. Um, the Common Core English Regents, as you probably know, is very heavily focused on nonfiction. Um, so we want to make sure that they feel comfortable with that. Um, we know in their content classes there is almost exclusively nonfiction. Um, so we want to build their skills in that area as well. The AP language curriculum for English um, is very heavy on nonfiction and essays and not as much on fiction. So for the honors students especially, we want them to feel prepared. We also know that college reading, um, especially freshman year in the required English courses, the load is almost entirely nonfiction. So we want to make sure that we have our students ready for what they need to do. So we came up with sort of um, an interesting idea, we think, um, and that was to team up with the science department. So I had a willing science teacher, Ms. Garcia, who teaches physics, and she was um, ready to take this on with me, and we developed an inquiry that we would tackle one topic in our two classrooms. We did this so that the students could have a deeper understanding of uh, difficult topics. 
that they would have a better end product. And in this case, it was the argumentative essay, which we know is something they will also need to do on the Common Core regions. Um, it was also a way in for the content teacher, in this case the physics teacher, Ms. Garcia, to feel more comfortable teaching literacy in the classroom since this is something we're all moving to. This was sort of um, you know, a teamwork way so that she didn't feel alone in teaching this topic and feeling like the literacy burden was on her. We also wanted to build the student endurance for reading nonfiction since um, they're going to have to be reading for longer and longer passages. So this was a way to control for that. So here's what we did. We came up with the topic, can new football helmet technology result in reduced concussions for players? We chose this topic because it's, it's a high interest topic and we wanted to bring in the boys which is um, and sometimes can be struggling more with literacy and this topic is interesting. There's a lot of physics involved as it turns out with football helmets. I had no idea uh, but now I do that uh, there's g-forces, rotational versus linear forces, um, there's new technology involving magnets, there's these non-Newtonian fluid pouches and these are complex topics and we had six articles to get through um, of multiple pages, so the students were able to get a repeated exposure. They not only went over the articles with me, but they went over them with Ms. Garcia. So for the students that were struggling, it was a, a real help, and for the students who wanted to go deeper, it was um, an opportunity as well. What we did and what I could provide was going through these articles, and here I could use my literacy techniques to go over highlighting and annotating and as we laid out the Cornell note style for the articles so that they could um, see a summary and they also had a summary sheet so they could do this individually but we did a lot full class and they got through all of these articles on a deep level we always are trying to make sure that we use the tier 2 vocabulary so this was an opportunity for them to see that in their science and English the same words can be used and we, we try to push them to use these higher level words in their writing and their cross content now one thing that I couldn't do was what the students decided they wanted to do which is to go deeper into what is really happening with forces and non-Newtonian fluids and rotational forces and so what Ms. Garcia was able to do with them is to have them conduct these experiments. The students designed an experiment to figure out what is really happening and is it effective. So the students designed, uh, they found out all sorts of different ways of how are they going to measure force and what, what, what protection is going to work and they ended up with a pendulum that Ms. Garcia worked with them on so they took this on their own. They became so interested in the topic that they wanted to design their own experiment and they wrote up the lab as they went. That was something I could never have done on my own um, and so the two of us working together we think it was a pretty successful project. Now I want to just bring it back to the honors um, extension with the honors students then in the English class we pushed them to go further we want them to make the thematic question back to essential questions, look at the social implications as well. At this point we are planning to, I'll invite my co-teachers to come back on board and we have some questions that we've received so um, I think Ms. Alonzo is going to begin with a question that she got. Okay so I have a question here that says what are some of the most positive or rewarding aspects of teaching bilingually? Uh, to me um, I taught first in a mainstream school where bilinguals were taught by immersion and it was not the best for the students. I had students who could not understand the math so they didn't learn it. So I actually searched for a school that was uh, trying to develop bilingual students which is what I am and I appreciate having both languages. So it's very rewarding to be teaching in an environment where I'm able to develop bilingualism since I am bilingual and I value it as, as a, a resource for everybody. So that to me is what is, is very powerful. I don't have to teach in Spanish or in English only or force the students to go one language or another, but I can develop both languages. So now I believe Leonor has a question. So my question reads, what do you do to help students understand the complex Common Core Social Studies based text? Um, I would say in our school it truly is a team effort. Um, as you heard from my colleague Susan Lally, she teaches a lot about annotating, um, close reading. Um, there's cognates like um, Isagma mentioned in her class. She teaches all these math of this math terminology that sometimes even overlaps in my class when I'm teaching them the rules for corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Corollary, un corollario, 
that is a math term. So it really is a team effort to get to, um, students um, to be able to engage with the Common Core text. In my class in particular, I provide translations because um, translating a text does not mean that you're making it in any way easier. A complex speech from the 1800s is equally difficult in English or in Spanish. I do rafts with the students. I do the gallery walk activities before. One of the main differences is that I guess in the regions the students are provided in the DBQs with excerpts of text and the Common Core provides them with full text from which they have to extract meaning. So I try to provide them with text dependent questions to um, help them pull out the most salient points in an article and help them out that way. But like I said, it really is a school-wide team effort to get the students ready. My colleague Susan has another question. I do. I got a question that says, in addition to following student need, do you have certain times or lessons that focus on developing one language or the other? Well, as their English or NDSL teacher, obviously our classes are all in English. It is the time during the day where that is the language of instruction in the classroom. And trying to get the students to feel comfortable participating orally um, can happen by working in small groups or doing a think-pair-share and then um, hopefully having them feel more comfortable using their English in the classroom. As you heard from Ms. Leonor and Ms. Alonzo, uh, we make room for the students as they're learning the language to make sure that what's really essential is that they understand the underlying concepts. And in the English class, obviously, that ultimately needs to be expressed in English, and most of our students who are, are college-bound will be going to all English programs. But we do find that as they um, come up through ninth grade through twelfth, um, they get where they need to be. I mean, we do have high expectations of them and they, they reach those, um, but in terms of a language policy one day or the other, that's not really our approach. I think Ms. Alonso has another question. Yes, I do. Do you ever require that students write in one language or the other? How do you know when to do this and when to be more flexible? I do not usually require students or force students to one language or another in a math class. I understand both languages, the students are bilingual. The idea, which Leonor presented very well, is that the students develop the content, that they can express complex thoughts, questions, and learn in whatever language they feel more comfortable using. So there is no time where I would force a student to go one language or another. I have at times mentioned to students if they are in an English dominant class and they're in front of the room and I know they're English dominant to, uh, do it, to, to explain in English, but if the student tells me I want to practice my Spanish, that's also perfectly acceptable. So Leonor now has uh, a question. Yeah, I have one more question. Um, how do you group students to help them so in my class, students are seated uh, usually in groups of three, and I pair them um, as not low, medium, high based on their language acquisition, but low, medium, high in terms of their performance in my class. Um, you learn which students are prefer to speak in English and which prefer to speak in Spanish in class, and I try to mix that up as well. And I like to have the differences in abilities in the group so that there's students that can help each other but also not too big of a gap so that students just don't interact. So I group them that way and that's been so far very successful. Um, now I think Susan has one more question. Yes, thanks uh, Ms. Leonor. So I have a question that says how do you plan with content teachers to ensure that you can collaborate? This is a great question because this is definitely a push our school is making. Um, this project that I just did with Ms. Garcia with the physics and football helmet, um, we created on our own deciding that this would be really useful for the teachers, um, for the students um, and for the teachers actually. We both got a lot out of it. Um, so we use our professional period. Um, we use email, we use um, Google Docs, uh, any way that we can find to communicate. Um, and we both, it sort of happened organically, but there is time in our program um, that student, that teachers can co-plan. And um, doing cross um, content planning is really um, exciting. It's something that um, is really valuable. So we used our professional periods and we used a lot of email and we put it together that way. And it's worked out really well. And it's definitely something I want to do again now that we've done it. Um, we've done it with the humanities, with um, history and English working together, but going English to science was a little bit new, and it's something that we'll hopefully continue. Um, so doing, doing our um, preps and our professional periods, that's what we would work on. So at this point, um, I think question and answer is over, and I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah to continue. 
Thank you so much, Susan, and thank you to all the panelists today for such an engaging discussion. I'm now going to hand it over to Ophelia Garcia, who will be the discussant today, and she'll really be pulling all the threads together for us um, in a nice way. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been a real pleasure to be here today and to listen to this wonderful presentation by Mirza, Isagma, Michelle, and Susan. What I want to do in the next five minutes is sort of remind us what we have heard. I come today with a heavy heart. Last night, Joshua Fishman, who was my mentor and teacher um, and the friend of bilingual educators all over the world and the friend of language minorities all over the world, passed away. And one of the books that was very influential when I was a young scholar or student was a book on bilingual education in which he makes the point that bilingual education is good for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I'm really so proud of, of bringing to you today the work of uh, Manhattan Bridges because I think it exemplifies how it is that you can work with bilingualism with an entire community, not just those that are classified as English language learners, but everybody. And I think in that they're quite unique. It's also important that they are a secondary school. And that is, uh, of course, difficult work because as many of the teachers have said, it is the content that also has to be transmitted through um, a language that sometimes students do not quite have yet. You know, I want to just comment on some of the things that Mirsa, as the principal, said, and then uh, pick up on some of the things that the teacher said. One of the things that is very evident to me is that there's committed leadership in the school. Mirsa clearly has a vision. She understands the expectations, what she wants to accomplish. As she said, sometimes it's not a straight arrow. It doesn't always happen the way that she has planned, but at least she has a vision. I think one has to start with a vision. And clearly this school is about having a vision that bilingualism and biliteracy is possible for all Latino students, whether they come in as being categorized as, uh, as English language learners or not. And therefore, she can establish then the collaborative structures that we heard from the teachers one of the things that strikes me when I listen to them is the tremendous consistency that there is among the teachers. The teachers, and when you visit the school, this is all also very obvious. It's in the bulletin boards. It's in what the teachers talk about. They have the same language to talk about it. They focus on, on certain things. For example, argumentative essays are um, a big thing of what they're doing now. They have come up with this meal uh, plan, which they're all using. And regardless of what you use, it has to be collaborative. And I think that that is and consistent. And I think that is, um, it's very, very important. Mirza also provides the time for them to have interdisciplinary meetings so that they can share. And as you hear, there is tremendous strength here, not only in the leadership of the school, but also in the educators that teach these kids. Because as they told me last week when I visited them, uh, they love doing what they're doing. And that love really comes through in how they're working through uh, sometimes difficult situations in having the tremendous success that they have had. One of the things that also strikes me is that they do not begin with a model or with a structure. Uh, they begin with the children. They begin with who the kids are, who, who it is that they're teaching. And then they adjust the structures to meet those needs. And that is tremendously important. Bilingualism is always used as a resource. You heard Mirza talk about amplifying, not simplifying, and certainly in the work that the teachers put forth today, there is a lot of amplification, right? Accelerated courses, AP courses, honors. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're at, you are able and you can be challenged to do that. Another thing that comes through is the idea that the teaching in the school adapts to the culture of the children, the strength that they bring to the school. The teachers and the educators there look for ways of building on their strengths. And they seem to have found it because, as you've heard, their success is quite high. They assess not just with what is given to them. Mirza talked about not taking the, the students as just the labels that they come in with, but assessing them with assessment instruments that they develop themselves for their students. This is extremely important. This, this idea of growing your own is extremely important, and I think that's what we all have to do. We have to take a look at what exists, who the students are, and then think of what needs to be done. I think another idea is that they're, they're all educators. That is, they're constantly assessing not only the children, but themselves. They're constantly reflecting on 
what needs to happen so that then you can have the creative collaborations that Susan spoke about. This has uh, acknowledged the fact that her teachers work three times or four times as hard as other teachers, but that this is a collaborative effort. This is a partnership. It's a partnership with families. It's a partnership with other um, institutions and organizations. And this is, is extremely important to think about the fact that the school is a whole ecology. It is not just, uh, it is not just uh, a structure that exists on its own just to uh, test children and have scores, but, but it exists because of this commitment and there is a way of, of growing all of this. What struck me in what the teacher said, of course, was a lot of emphasis on the language, on using the cognates that they already know, those that they know and those that they do not know, and starting again where the students are at, and growing their vocabulary, thinking of how to make sure that you have a context first to the code is what Michelle told us about, starting with a gallery walk, and accepting translanguaging when it occurs, and accepting the fact that students sometimes have to have a choice of language, because what they're doing is that they're, they're doing the hard work of choosing evidence from the text uh, in the way that the Common Core is asking them to do. And the idea, again, that not only do the teachers work collaboratively, but also the, the students are working collaboratively in groups, and this is something that they do quite, uh, quite well. And of course, again, what we heard from uh, Susan as far as the nonfiction work and the fact that they are uh, teaming up, uh, that she's teaming up with the science teacher, very, very unusual. And what it, again, what is interesting about all of, of, of the work in Manhattan Bridges is that they have the same techniques that everybody else has, right? Highlighting, annotation, Cornell note styles, but what they do is, is based on really what the students know and do, their real life, their culture, their language, and also the extension of it being something that is honor giving, that you're indeed going to celebrate and understand that what the students are doing is difficult work. We are delighted that you have been with us today. I want to remind you that we will send you an email with instructions on how to receive a $50 stipend for a webinar-related task that we will send to you. Not all of you have to do it, but we welcome your collaboration in this. What we're trying to build is we're trying to build a network of educators that understand how to do all this. And it's very, very important that we not only archive the webinar that we just had on our webpage, and you can access it so that you can all understand it and show it to other people, but also that you share with us for Manhattan Bridges or for the rest of the schools in the state, what it is that you have done that works. I remind you that there's a webinar next uh, week on Monday, March 9th. It's a study group webinar. It requires registration and another one on March 16th. We really look forward to your participation. And on behalf of uh, CUNY NICEV and Dr. Maite Sanchez, gracias por estar con nosotros. Adios.